It is showtime. Good morning, Lisa. Where's Lisa at? The human. <laughs> well, okay, me, can, can you find Lisa for me, please? We did promise to anyone who watched last week's live that there would be a special <laughs> uh, guest appearance today. The Humicorn is here live in the Circle Leadership <laughs> Studio, uh, sprinkling fairy dust and rainbow, unicorn rainbows everywhere. Uh, for all of us, which is awesome. Uh, so so great to have you here as always. But let's get into the real action as to why we're here today. Uh, what are we doing today? Coaching. Coaching. Coaching yes. today. Why is coaching so important in business today? Because if you want great people in business, <clears throat> You can't boss someone into greatness. You can only coach them. That is an amazing. Like, who came up with that? I know. I know. <laughs> so, so let's talk about <clears throat> yes, the whole this whole live stream and this whole theme for this week for us actually has been through our content we've been producing. The newsletter for those of you who see our weekly newsletter that comes up through LinkedIn um, is really about you can't boss someone into greatness. So it's about how to become a coach, not a boss, uh, because in today's world, that's what people are looking for. So I'm going to bring this in here. Uh, oh, look at that. There we are. <clears throat> so I want to run through this uh, small presentation just to share some concepts with you all, do a little bit of whiteboard magic, if technology, our prayer to the technology gods work this morning. Yes. And uh, we'll go through some stuff and hopefully just to help you understand a little bit more about, um, you know, how to think about becoming a coach, not a boss. Okay, and uh, it's not just something you can just flick a switch instantly. I appreciate it because of human behavior, but let's take a look at it. Firstly, <clears throat> the reason we're, we're bringing this in is because over the past couple of years, the world's shifted a little bit, business has shifted a little bit, um, how we think about leadership, how we think about work has shifted, uh, and a lot of organizations weren't ready for that. A lot of leaders weren't ready for what was deemed the future of work or the future of leadership. But this thing called the pandemic has sort of accelerated a whole bunch of things now and we have people working in all different places. We have distributed working going on. Uh, how do we maintain a culture when people are working all over the place? How do we help our people become their best? Um, and people just weren't ready or skilled or prepared for that. So what we've decided to do is do whatever we can to help educate people uh, in things, that, simple things that they can do to help their people become their best and do their life's best work, even if you weren't ready for it yet. So. If you look at the modern world today, uh, the future of work, which is really what we call now the now of work, um, is that we're looking for new organizational models, networks of teams independent but interlinked. Um, <clears throat> so these are some of the, the trends that are that were predicted that are actually happening now. Uh, people wanting coaches, not bosses, which is what today's all about, is how do we empower, build, and coach our teams? How do we create amazing employee experiences? And how do we leverage new technologies to bring people together? But the one that we're gonna focus on today is primarily just becoming a coach, not a boss. So the first thing we challenge people to do is, is really understand that what is your definition of leadership? And, and so this is our definition at Circle Leadership. This is how we define leadership. And leadership is all about helping other people become the best version of themselves so they can do their life's best work while in your care and beyond. And that means we care about you as a human being first, employee second. All right. And it's really important to understand this. So, so our role, or even my role in our organization is to help our team become the best to do their life's best work while in my care and beyond. And I look at everyone as a human being first, employee second. Right. Which is why we have a human unicorn in our team. <laughs> uh, but it's really important to understand that that's what leadership is all about. And in this definition, it all also it does not say you have to have a position or a title to demonstrate leadership. You may be a leader or manager by position or title, but that does not denote leadership. Okay, so leadership is all about helping other people become the best to do their best while in your care and beyond. So in order to do that, if we want to help people become their best uh, or become as great as they're capable of, you just can't boss someone into being their best or into greatness, as it were. So I want to just go through some of the things we would need to look at in terms of how do we shift from becoming, sort of being a boss to becoming a coach. Um, Jim Collins, and the, the concept of this came from, uh, if you look at Jim Collins's work about good to great. So first and foremost, if you wanna take your organization from good to great, what in your organization needs to go from good to great for the organization itself to go from good to great? And that would be the people. 
right? So, and uh, Jim Collins in his book also said, great visions without great people is irrelevant. So we need to, we can have the most grandiose, amazing, we we're, we we're talking with a, a client yesterday in New Zealand and they got this really amazing work that they're doing in the world and their vision for the world is gonna be so powerful. But without great people, they're not going to get there. They can have, you can have the most grandiose vision in the world, but without great people, you're not gonna get there. So the concept then is you, you can't boss someone into greatness. Okay, no one's ever been bossed into greatness. And if we need our organization to be great, to fulfill that vision, then we need to help our team become great. And therefore, this is why you need to shift to becoming a coach, not a boss. So what's the difference between a coach and a boss? Well, this diagram hopefully depicts most of the difference between a coach and a boss. A boss is someone who comes and gives you direction, tells you what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Um, you know, and there are some terms of endearment where boss is used. I've, a lot of people that I've worked with in the past have called me boss still. Like, hey boss, how you doing? But it's more a term of endearment rather than because I was bossy. Okay, so please understand, like, you know, there's nothing wrong with it as a term of endearment, but if you're being a boss in terms of your bossing people around and the thing where I'm the boss, you're my subordinate, you report to me, you do as you're told, you're paid to work, not to think, all these things that bosses would look at people, you're never going to help your people become the best version of themselves and do the last best work uh, while they're in your care and beyond. What you might do out of fear and incentive is like, because bosses use fear and incentive to motivate people. They uh, either th say, if you don't do this, you're going to get in trouble for it. Or, hey, if you do this, I'll dangle this carrot. We'll give you this wonderful incentive. Okay, so bosses use fear and incentive to motivate people, whereas coaches inspire people from the inside out. And they use what, like what I call attitude motivation. So it's people um, helping them become their best through helping them identify what it is that they want to be and who they want to accomplish and what they want to accomplish in their life. And the coach will help you bring out the best in you whereas a boss will motivate you from the outside. Um, so if anybody's watching uh, or listening to this, I'd love you to just throw in the comments here. What do you think the answer to this is? When I talk to leaders, I go, tell me what your people, you wish your people would do, or you know, <clears throat> finish this sentence. I wish my people would. And what do we think some of the things, Lisa, what are some of the things you, you think that a lot of business owners or leaders say after that? I wish my people would think for themselves i wish my people would show more initiative that's a big one because yep. so often people if they're given a direction they're happy to do it yep. but unless they're told to pick up the broom and broom the floor they won't yeah so use your initiative think for themselves um, i wish my people would be more accountable right all these things that, that leaders say so first thing i always say in return to them is you've allowed that to happen and then it's followed up with, I keep having to, and what do you think they say then is, I keep having to do everything myself anyway, yeah. fix up their mistakes. If I'm going to have to do the work in the long run, why would I try and help or tell anybody what to do? Yeah, absolutely. So I keep having to do the work myself. I have to keep doing the thinking for them. I have to keep telling them what to do. I have to keep... You know, so these are the things that happen. And this is what happens when you're a boss in your organization, all right? Uh, and so for us, um, it's really important to understand the process for human behavior then in, in terms of if you want your people to learn to think for themselves, uh, how are you helping them to do that? Or are you actually the thing that's hindering them from doing that? Now I'm gonna do a little bit more exercise uh, on this on the whiteboard in a second, but just understanding that, you know, success for that individual comes from their results. So all these things I've accomplished in my life formulates my picture of success. Those results have come from my behavior. I've taken these actions to drive these results and get me this success. Now, what we know about human behavior for the past couple hundred years is that how I think determines how I act. So my attitude is my habits of thinking. They've been conditioned into me through a process of space repetition of a bunch of inputs from parents, teachers, media, society, you name it, people's opinions that I've varied. Uh, sorry, valued, people's opinions I've valued, I've heard repetitively, conditions the way I think about things, causing me to behave the way I do, getting me the results and success I may or may not be enjoying in my life right now. That's human behavior. And then all of a sudden we say, hey, I need you. So this is where we boss people. Uh, you know, we've identified these new results we'd like to have in our organization and in, in, in your role. Here's the behaviors that would drive that. Start doing these things to get those results. And then you start doing those things to get those results. And about a couple of weeks into it, you fall back into old behavioral patterns and stuff like that. Or you just don't do the things you need to do for whatever reason it is. 
and you don't get the results. And then your boss comes, well, I'm going to threaten you. If you don't start behaving this way and doing these things, then you're going to lose your job. Or, hey, if you start behaving this way and achieving these results, I'm going to give you this golden carrot. And then once again, with willpower, you fight to do those things. But then after a while, you go back again to doing those things. Why? Well, because how I think determines how I act. So if I haven't shifted my thinking to drive new behaviors, well, then I'm going to fall back to the automatic pilot that's already programmed in my head, which is my attitudes, my habits of thinking that I have, which drive the old behaviors. And this is why then you keep having to do the thinking for your team's bosses. This is why you keep having to challenge them about taking initiative. This is why you have to hold them to account because they're not accountable. This is is because you're not actually helping them shift their thinking to drive new behaviors to achieve new results by becoming who they're capable of becoming. You're not helping them become their best version of themselves to do their life's best work while in your care and beyond. You're just in this vicious cycle of do this thing to get that result. You're not doing that thing. Either I need to incentivize you or threaten you. And that's not helping your people achieve greatness. And that's why you have to keep doing the work in your mind. That's why you there's no accountability. There's no initiative because they're just waiting to be told because that's what usually happens right here. Or they're waiting for you to jump in and save the day, which is what you usually do. So what you need to be able to do is learn how to coach your team and ask smarter questions about how to coach the gap. Okay. And this is what's really important here. So I'm going to attempt to switch from this here for a moment to this here. Look at that. So that, by the way, that template up there, anybody who wants that template, if you put coach, not hashtag coach, not boss in any of the streams or comments, um, we'll get you a copy of that PDF. I'll bring it back up in a moment anyway, but I just want to, I want to share this with you here. So as we talked about the process for human behavior, so success from our results, from our behavior, from our thinking. Now you're saying, hey, we want new results. And we said, well, if we'd like to have something we've never had before, we would need to become someone we've never been before. All right. And this is why success is about who you need to become. So if we can help this person go, well, what would you like to have you've never had in terms of results? Who would you need to be to have those results? Then how would that person behave? And if you look at behave, it's just be and have together. And then what thinking would drive that behavior? Okay. So if this is uh, over here, let's go, this here is the old way of thinking, and this is the new way of thinking. Now, if we're looking at it like this, if we said, okay, well, we've identified all this new stuff and we brought that down here. When we, we sit there and someone starts taking action towards their goals, we've already identified what the results are, the behaviors and the thinking. Now they take action. And then guess what? It doesn't, the action that they're taking does not match this behavior. It actually matches this behavior. So all of a sudden we see them behaving like this. When we know this is the behavior that will drive these results. And what we do know is that there's this thinking that would drive that behavior. The one thing that we don't know is what were you thinking? Okay. So talk to me about what was going on there. Because I know what thinking would drive the right behavior. This thinking drives that behavior. I saw the behavior you demonstrated. They don't match. And instead of sitting there going as a boss going, well, start behaving like this and throw in the carrot and the, the, the stick. I say, ask them to tell you what they were thinking. And not in a, like, oh, my God, what were you thinking? Like, oh, my God, I can't believe my technology just dropped out again. Not in an, oh, my God, what were you thinking kind of a way. It was perfect timing, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they were so good. The, the technology gods for so, such a short window there. Um, not in an, oh, my God, what were you thinking kind of a way. Um, hang on, look at this. Watch this. We're back. Oh, you are the technology god, Dave. It's you. Oh, yes. It's you. <laughs> So not like, what we want to do then is how do I help them shift this thinking to that thinking? And this is what we call coaching the gap. Okay, so if I can identify what the thinking is, there's, there's, by the way, as a coach, there's three things you need to know fundamentally to be a coach. Where are you? Where would you like to be? And then why do you want to get there? So if we can help this person shift their thinking we understand why, because it's about achieving this level of success. We go, okay, so, hey, that situation. So, Lisa, um, you know how we talked about such and such, and this is the thing that would drive those results. Um, I noticed that this was happening. Talk to me about that. Tell me about what's going on there. What we, what, you know, what were you thinking? And then you would go, well, I was thinking this and this. And I would go, okay, great. 
So who's responsible for that? Why did that happen? Where do you see that going? How a, a bunch of simple, short questions to get you to shift your thinking. Oh, that's right. I, if I do this, it was that. And if we put this over here, we're supposed to do this, which is that, which would drive that, which will do that, which will get that. So it's about starting to ask smart, simple questions to coach the gap from the thinking that exists to the thinking you know that's needed to drive the right behaviors and get the results. And this is how we start coaching our people. And, you know, when we want our people to think for themselves, the old adage at work uh, that existed back in my days was, Dave, you're paid to work not to think. Right. And I'm, I joke with leaders today half heartedly, but seriously going, hey, you're here to think. And while you're here, if you did some work, that'd be awesome. All right. It's is how do we help people learn to think for themselves? You're paying for 100% of that person to be in your organization, yet you and your system and the way you lead or the culture of your organization or the way you boss your organization may be only tapping into 50% of what that person can bring to your workplace. You're not, we're not allowing them to bring their best self to work. Can you imagine if we allowed everyone to bring their best self to work and that we help them in a coaching environment to continually take the new thinking and, and shift all the time with repetition, we would just keep with repetition, driving this new way of thinking all the time. This is what we need to be able to do. And so in order to do that, we developed this simple template here of a bunch of questions that you can ask uh, to help coach that gap from the thinking that exists to the thinking that you need to have that will drive those behaviors, to get you the result and success that you're looking for. Um, and it's based on, so if you look down the, the columns there, so it's, it's all the types of questions, the who, what, why, where, when, and how questions. And then across the, the top, it's, is it a present situation, a future situation, an intent situation? Is it a process? Is it accountability? And there's no, no uh, structure to this in terms of you need to ask this first or that. But as I was having a conversation with someone at a, at a manufacturing facility and they were complaining about something that was going on, my first question was who is responsible? So who accountability is responsible? And they said, well, I guess ultimately I am. And I said, so what happened? And then when do you see this changing? What would need to happen to make that change? And then in the end, who would be responsible for that? Oh, crap, it's for me. So I need to take action and do something with that. Right? So it's just a simple series to help that person discover that they actually, uh, you know, it's what we talk about empowering, right? Lisa, we were talking this yesterday with clients as well. When you think about the word empower, um, in the old days, it was, I have to give my power to Lisa so she can do what I can do. And it didn't happen back in the 90s and 2000s because I don't want to let go of my power. Like my whole ego and pride and my my uh, you know silo and my empire I've built is built on my power. And you want me to empower people and give them power? Well, empowerment really is about helping people realize they've always had the power. But it's 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 setting up for where I want to give you the framework and the tools to unleash the power you already have. And what I'm in control of is the framework and allowing you to make smarter decisions through that framework and helping you to discover that. Um, Joe's raised a great question here. So why do you think leaders are afraid to allow others to bring their best self to work? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do you think, Lisa? Oh, goodness me. Um, there's a little thing that you just alluded to, Dave, yeah. and, and why we we at Circle Leadership operate and set up our structures around eco systems, not ego yeah. systems. Yep. And I think that the, I don't want to put anyone in a pot here, no. um, but from personal experience, I think that a lot of the, like you say, the early 90s and the 2000s hierarchical corporate structures mm. in 2022, we're still operating in that framework, but it's very much of an ego system framework rather than ecosystem. So, what are, what are your thoughts, Dave? What, what would you like? Yeah, no, to yeah, yeah. And so, that, based on those two structures, so it's simple to me when I look at this. If, if someone doesn't want, or a leader doesn't want to allow someone to bring uh, their other to bring the best self to work, one of the reasons is they're afraid that person might show them up or be better than they are, right? Um, and and so that they'll be bigger or achieve more than they were. Now, Brendan, he's just jumped on. He said uh, they don't know what they don't know and have stopped learning. So that leader, yeah, that other person might know more than them or anything like that. But the funny thing is, and, you know, everyone quotes Steve Jobs on stuff and what a great leader, leader he was. And <clears throat> I think Steve Jobs 2.0 was a much better leader than the very first Steve Jobs. Like second time at Apple, he was a much better leader. He was a lot more empathetic to people. Um, but he said, we don't 
hire smart people so we can tell them what to do. We hire smarter people so they can tell us what to do. So the reason, Joe, I believe is that ego or whatever, people were um, afraid that that person would show them up or possibly take their job. Or if I help them look too good, then they didn't realize that that was what their job was. They didn't understand. Yeah, for your best, they didn't understand what their job was. My job is actually to help you bring your best to work. My job is to stay slightly better than you and help you bring whatever you can. As long as you're not better than me, my job is to help you to be the best you can be. And then I will be recognized for my ability to bring out the best in people. And what I was fearful of is being recognized that I have people that are better than me and my team. And then they would get promoted faster than I would in corporate world. That's my take on that. Um, and yeah, Brendan also raised the fact that leadership isn't taught in mainstream education. 100% no. It's definitely not taught in there. And it should be. Um, leadership, not leaders and managers. And uh, and uh, please, all uh, for anyone listening to this who this may offend, um, it's not intended to offend you as an individual, but it is my take on the whole leadership and management training that we give today. Most of what we call leadership training today is modern management practices. There's not much based on actual leadership and about how do we help people become the best and do their best while in our care and beyond. How do we build those amazing cultures where we have ecosystems, where we have leadership depth and strength in our organization, where there's all around leadership, not top down leadership, where everybody answers to something first, not to someone. And where people actually come to work. Can you imagine going to work where everyone's trying to lift each other up every single day? Because even as the almighty leader that I might seemingly be for circle leadership, I'm a human being and I'm going to fall down and I need people like Lisa, Al or Ben in our team to say, hey, Dave, man, come on. We need you to like, get back up and help me back up. I might need to be coached from time to time, too. Right. So this is what we need to make sure we're doing in our organizations. So I created this simple template. This is a client of ours. I actually said, Dave, can you just dump all your questions you ask us into a thing? And, and this is what I come up with. So anybody wants this. I know a few people have already put hashtag coach, not boss. If you'd like it, that's yours. Um, it's a real simple template that you can use uh, and just to get you in the habit of asking questions, because as a leader in a coaching format, if 80% of the words that come out of your mouth aren't in the shape of a question, then you're starting to tell, not ask. Yeah, 100%, Joe, leadership is all about building people up. And I want our team to be bigger and better and faster and smarter and more capable than I've ever been in my life, which really, with me, self-deprecating humor isn't too hard. Um, so... The last couple of things I want to share with you is about influence. Now, there's a lot of talk about from a leadership and it's about influence. So what is, how would you define influence? What does influence mean to you? So Joe, Be uh, Brendan, anyone else who's listening, watching this, Lisa, what's your take on influence? What is, you know, we, you know, John Maxwell has popularized the concept that leadership's all about influence. Now, it sounds like, you know, it's about manipulating people. I need to influence you to do something. But what does influence mean? I think it's interesting in this time, the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word influence is Instagram influencer, hashtag little, little blue tick. But honestly, you ask the kids, what's an influence? What's it? They'll be like, oh, Instagram influencer, blue tick. Yeah, it, uh, it's uh, shaking my booty with a, you know, a can of Coke <laughs> saying, buy some Coke, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, like that's an influencer. Um, it, well, that's a modern day definition of an influencer. Creating impact, Joe said. Yeah. So the simplest way, and, and Lisa knows this well about me, and for those of you who have seen me present numerous times, know I love words, right? So for me, I'm always fascinated by words because I think words matter. Um, and uh, as I look at the word influence, the, so Brendan's got here, the ability to challenge someone's thinking to achieve the best outcome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you look at the word influence, in is a prefix for into, and fluence is the Latin derivative of the word fluid or flow. So if you want to create influence. It's about helping people get into flow. And when are we at our best, Lisa? When we're in flow state, right? So when we're in flow state, that's when we are at our best. So influence is about getting people into flow. Okay. And this is when your team perform your best. So your job is to influence your team is to help them become the best and do their best work while in your care and beyond, which is why we need to create influence in our organization. But once again, no position or title required to do that. So I'm a firm believer that if you're coaching your people and helping them become the best version of themselves to do their life's best work, you're using influence, you're helping them get into flow state where they're, they're at their best and they can form, perform at their best. 
that people will deliver exceptional value when they feel exceptionally valued. Okay, so why would you not want your team to deliver exceptional value to your clients? Our clients deserve the best. They deserve the best from us. So if I'm not striving to be the best that I can be and do the, my life's best work while I'm in my team's care, how am I supposed to create space and capacity for their greatness and their capabilities to become the best that they can become? So if I become the best I can be, I can help my team become the best that they can be because our clients deserve our best. In order to do that, I need to make sure that our team feel exceptionally valued, that they're so important in this process because I know that that's when they're going to start delivering exceptional value. Um, and then in the end, how we think and feel then about our organization uh, is culture. And this is what I want people to understand this. Like this is why when we talk about coaching our teams into greatness, so can you imagine, have you ever been served by anyone who does like great work and the world just loves where they're doing it? You can see the greatness in them. They can see the joy uh, at the work they're doing, where they're doing the work. And how does that add to your experience as a customer or consumer? Like it, it, as soon as you serve, like you race home, you have to go tell somebody. Like, oh my God, Lisa, you would not believe the person who served me today. It could be the barista at the coffee shop, doesn't matter where it was. Like, like this person was like, like off the planet enthusiastic. They must just love. I'd like to know what they're what what what's in the coffee they're drinking. Right? It's just like you want to tell people. So culture is how we think and feel. And when we speak that love to the market through uh, the way that we do our work, well the market uh, and the consumer is brand. Brand is just how the market and consumer thinks and feels. So when we're speaking our love to the market, the the market and the consumer can't help but respond in kind and fall in love with why we do what we do. And this is all why we need to become a coach, not a boss. And I know Lisa wrote a, wrote a great article in the newsletter yesterday. It was about, you know, in sports as a semi-pro athlete in her time uh, that <clears throat> I love that semi-pro, right? semi-pro athlete in her time that um, you don't have the head, the head boss, the offensive boss, the defensive boss, the special teams boss. You have the head coach, the offense coach, the defense coach, the special teams coach. So in sporting and business, uh, the business of sporting, they still have coaches, not bosses. Now, I appreciate in the office, they might have a general manager and all that sort of stuff. But in the field of things where everything happens, they have coaches. So I would encourage you to become a coach, not a boss. <clears throat> so that's what we want to share with you guys. It's 27 minutes in. Um, hopefully you understand why you should become a coach, uh, not a boss. Hopefully we've shared with some uh, the, the process and how to help people shift their thinking. Um, and there's obviously the, uh, obviously the template left that you can have. Uh, if you put hashtag coach, not boss, um, even if you watch this later, um, that's yours to have. We'll get to that PDF sent to you. Um, you can print out and keep it in front of you. It's a really simple tool. Oh, I'm going to get it for myself. Look at that. <laughs> I would mind one of those myself. Um, any last thoughts, comments, Lisa, you want to add to uh, today's live stream? I think you've nailed it as always, boss. <laughs> <laughs> Term of endearment. <laughs> <laughs> we should come up with our own definition of um, of what boss means to us at Circle Leadership. Yeah, like a boss. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thank you, Joe. Joe. And thanks, Brendan, and anyone else who, who tuned in. Um, uh, I really appreciate it. So if anyone has any questions, uh, please drop them in the comments after the fact too. Lisa and I will keep our eye on that and we'll answer anything we can. We'll get those things. Uh, thanks, Brendan, mate. Much appreciated. I am so looking forward to going and seeing Brendan and his team in Melbourne in a couple of weeks' time. Oh, it's going to be amazing. And then right. where are you coming, Dave? Then it's Queensland. <laughs> yeah, we'll do Thursday live in the house. And if yeah. there's anyone in your world or in your spaces that you feel like could really, that this would land and drop with them and it could add a lot of value to their thankful Thursday, please do share. We're just all about spreading the love and the good vibes. So, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Okay, guys, it's uh, 29 minutes and 13 seconds. Oh, where do I get one of Lisa's hats? Yeah. <laughs> It's the best, right? Um, this came from Toys R Us about eight years ago. And a really good friend of mine was buying one for her six-year-old daughter and went, I know who else would love one of these. And <laughs> it's not another six-year-old. <laughs> well, here's the funny thing. Is it's, it, you did get, it, uh, yeah, did get it at Toys R Us, but it's actually now Toys Were Us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Gee, that's a wormhole we could get into as to why and yeah, how. And yeah, oh, yeah. I've uh, spoken that. So Gordon the Giraffe uh, is no longer employed. He's uh, 
He's unemployed now. He's trying to work. Anyone knows uh, looking for a, a giraffe mascot? You know, Gordon's looking for some work right now. He's been out of work for a while, but I'm sure he's still keen. The unicorn's not available. She's otherwise uh, occupied. Yes, don't you steal my unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. Yeah. Thankful Thursday okay. to you all. Take care. See you all.